wine and garb. You say you can look at the arc of your life and find it interesting. That's, I mean, that's what it's been for me. It's nice that it has been getting better and better. That's the only thing I pull out, uh, pull out of it. I mean, that's nice that it keeps trying. And the fact that I'm offered these amazing things to keep, to keep doing stuff that keeps exploring different aspects, that's wonderful too. The first movie was Popeye. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> if you remember, the opening scene is Robin in a rowboat in a storm. And I was just, here's this huge screen at Chinese theater in uh, Los Angeles. And I thought, that's Robin, my little boy Robin. Look at him, eat your heart out world, here he yeah. comes. <laughs> Performing and doing all these things, we never acknowledge anything negative. Where it's, and if you do, it gets very violent, like the time. Mm -hmm. What happens immediately after the scene you just saw is he starts to confront who you are. So mm -hmm. you, I know who you are. And he gets Supposing this world is a tree, are you leaves on its branches, or are you a bunch of birds that settled on a dead old tree from somewhere else? I believe that if we are honest with ourselves, that the most fascinating problem in the world is who am I? What do you mean? What do you feel when you say the word I? I myself. I don't think there can be any more fascinating preoccupation than that. Dear reader, Welcome to Herman Hesse's Siddhartha and the Visions by the SC Method of Reading. With this you read every word, but I ask you to commit 30 minutes at a stretch, which is half an episode, but preferably watch the whole 60 minutes the way you would an episode of your favorite Netflix show. Trust me, this is like magic. Herman Hesse's Siddhartha is a seminal work which communicated the first parts of Oriental mythology to the West in this incredibly insightful yet simple story. As someone who took many years to develop a reading and spiritual practice, this is something I'm doing to help others who also found it a challenge. I have a bit of a unique technique, and while there is a full speed reading version, this uses a scientific methodology from the Huberman Labs at Stanford that resets your brain every 20 minutes, allowing you to read much quicker and with much less fatigue. I have intentionally kept this slow, though it's still pretty quick. The voices of the narrators will change, as will the pace, as I am reading it with you and adjusting in real time. Artificial intelligence will only take you so far, and I consider the visions of the SCE method to be a new art form, which is better experienced firsthand than any description I could articulate. Make sure to use headphones. Don't try to read all the words. All you have to do is follow the blue highlighted word. Or don't just let it flow towards yourself like water, then you'll truly be woo why the principle of doing while not doing. Trust the process, you'll be amazed. There is no commercial intent to this, as yet, these are practices that have helped me see the light and I attribute my modicum of success to this and I hope to help you see yours. My only ask is that you pass the knowledge on, if you feel there's a way to improve or you have other ways to help humanity and you need funding or support, you can email visions at c1 or whatsapp me at plus 919-8126-12345. I'm also here for personal advice if you need me. Yes, I'm putting my real cell number there. The privacy boat sailed for me some time ago. This is dedicated to Bob Weir, founder of the Grateful Dead, who first saw a spiritual spark in me many years ago, much before me, and has encouraged and stood by me through thick and thin. My mentor, Admiral Owens, the former second highest ranking officer in the United States, who then retired to lead a leisurely life at CEO of Nortel and chairman of NYC Asia. Bill has taught me always to look on the bright side, and to RSA, the ocean from which the SCE emanates. Warmly, SC visions from the SC, an RSAC vision sent from the future. WWWC one. The son of the son of the Brahmin. In the shade of the house, in the sunshine of the riverbank near the boats, in the shade of the salwood forest, in the shade of the fig trees where Siddhartha grew up, the handsome son of the Brahmin, the young falcon, together with his friend Govinda, son of a Brahmin. The sun tanned his light shoulders by the banks of the river when bathing, performing the sacred ablutions, the sacred offerings. In the mango grove, shade poured into his black eyes when playing as a boy, when his mother sang, when the sacred offerings were made, when his father, the scholar, taught him when the wise men talked. For a long time, Siddhartha had been partaking in the discussions of the wise men, practicing debate with Govinda, practicing with Govinda the art of reflection, the service of meditation. 
He already knew how to speak the Om silently, the word of words, to speak it silently into himself while inhaling, to speak it silently out of himself while exhaling with all the concentration of his soul, the forehead surrounded by the glow of the clear thinking spirit. He already knew to feel Atman in the depths of his being, indestructible, one with the universe. Joy leapt in his father's heart for his son who was quick to learn, thirsty for knowledge. He saw him growing up to become great wise man and priest, a prince among the Brahmins. Bliss leapt in his mother's breast when she saw him, when she saw him walking, when she saw him sit down and get up, Siddhartha, strong, handsome, he who was walking on slender legs, greeting her with perfect respect. Love touched the hearts of the Brahmin's young daughters when Siddhartha walked through the lanes of the town with the luminous forehead, with the Ava king, with his slim hips, but more than all the others he was loved by Govinda, his friend, the son of a Brahmin. He loved Siddhartha's eye and sweet voice, he loved his walk and the perfect decency of his movements, he loved everything Siddhartha did and said, and what he loved most was his spirit, his transcendent, fiery thoughts, his ardent will, his high calling. Govinda knew he would not become a common Brahmin, not a lazy official in charge of offerings, not a greedy merchant with magic spells, not a vain, vacuous speaker, not a mean, deceitful priest, and also not a decent, stupid sheep in the herd of the many. No, and he, Govinda, as well did not want to become one of those, not one of those tens of thousands of Brahmins. He wanted to follow Siddhartha the Beloved, the Splendid. And in days to come, when Siddhartha would become a god, when he would join the Glorious, then Govinda wanted to follow him as his friend, his companion, his servant, his spear carrier, his shadow. Siddhartha was thus loved by everyone. He was a source of joy for everybody. He was a delight for them all. But he, Siddhartha, was not a source of joy for himself. He found no delight in himself. Walking the rosy paths of the fig tree garden, sitting in the bluish shade of the grove of contemplation, washing his limbs daily in the bath of repentance, sacrificing in the dim shade of the mango forest, his gestures of perfect decency, everyone's love and joy, he still lacked all joy in his heart. Dreams and restless thoughts came into his mind, flowing from the water of the river, sparkling from the stars of the night, melting from the beams of the sun. Dreams came to him in a restlessness of the soul, fuming from the sacrifices, breathing forth from the verses of the Rig Veda, being infused into him, drop by drop, from the teachings of the old Brahmins. Siddhartha had started to nurse discontent in himself. He had started to feel that the love of his father and the love of his mother and also the love of his friend, Govinda, would not bring him joy forever and ever, would not nurse him, feed him, satisfy him. He had started to suspect that his venerable father and his other teachers, that the wise Brahmins had already revealed to him the most and best of their wisdom, that they had already filled his expecting vessel with their richness, and the vessel was not full, the spirit was not content, the soul was not calm, the heart was not satisfied. The ablutions were good, but they were water, they did not wash off the sin, they did not heal the spirit's thirst, they did not relieve the fear in his heart. The sacrifices and the invocation of the gods were excellent, but was that all? Did the sacrifices give a happy fortune? And what about the gods? Was it really Prajapati who had created the world? Was it not the Atman, he, the only one, the singular one? Were the gods not creations, created like me and you subject to time mortal? Was it therefore good? Was it right? Was it meaningful in the highest occupation to make offerings to make offerings to the gods? For whom else were offerings to be made? Who else was to be worshipped but him, the only one, the Atman? And where was Atman to be found? Where did he reside? Where did his eternal heart beat? Where else but in one's own self, in its innermost part, in its indestructible part, which everyone had in himself? But where, where was this self, this innermost part, this ultimate part? It was not flesh and bone, it was neither thought nor consciousness, this the wisest ones taught so. Where, where was it? To reach this place, the self, myself, the Atman, there was another way which was worthwhile looking for. Alas, and nobody showed this way, nobody knew it, not the father, and not the teachers and wise men, not the holy sacrificial songs. They knew everything, the Brahmins and their holy books, they knew everything, they had taken care of everything, and of more than everything, the creation of the world, the origin of speech, of food, of inhaling, of exhaling, the arrangement of the senses, the acts of the gods, they knew infinitely much, but was it valuable to know all of this, not knowing that one and only thing, the most important thing, the solely important thing, Surely many verses of the holy books, particularly in the Upanishads of Samaveda, spoke of this innermost and ultimate thing, wonderful verses. Your soul as the whole world was written there, and it was written that man in his sleep, in his deep sleep, would meet with his innermost part and would reside in the Atman. Marvelous wisdom was in these verses. All knowledge of the wisest ones had been collected here in magic words, pure as honey collected by bees. No, not to be looked down upon was the tremendous amount of enlightenment which lay here collected and preserved by innumerable generations of wise Brahmins. But where were the Brahmins, where the priests, where the wise men or penitents who had succeeded in not just knowing this deepest of all knowledge but also to live it? Where was the knowledgeable one who wove his spell to bring his familiarity with the Atman out of the sleep into the state of being awake, into the life, into every step of the way, into word and deed? 
Siddhartha knew many venerable Brahmins, chiefly his father, the pure one, the scholar, the most venerable one. His father was to be admired, quiet and noble were his manners, pure his life, wise his words, delicate and noble thoughts lived behind its brow. But even he who knew so much, did he live in blissfulness? Did he have peace? Was he not also just a searching man, a thirsty man? Did he not again and again have to drink from holy sources as a thirsty man from the offerings, from the books, from the disputes of the Brahmins? Why did he, the irreproachable one, have to wash off sins every day, strive for cleansing every day, over and over every day? Was not Atman in him? Did not the pristine source spring from his heart? It had to be found, the pristine source in one's own self. It had to be possessed. Everything else was searching, was a dewer, was getting lost. Thus were Siddhartha's thoughts, this was his thirst, this was his suffering. Often he spoke to himself from a Shanaji Upanishad the words, Truly, the name of the Brahman is Satyam Verily, he who knows such a thing will enter the heavenly world every day. Often it seemed near the heavenly world, but never he had reached it completely, never he had quenched the ultimate thirst. And among all the wise and wisest men he knew and whose instructions he had received, among all of them there was no one who had reached it completely, the heavenly world, who had quenched it completely, the eternal thirst, Govinda Siddhartha spoke to his friend, Govinda, my dear, come with me under the banyan tree, let's practice meditation. They went to the banyan tree, they sat down, Siddhartha right here, Govinda twenty paces away. While putting himself down, ready to speak the Aum, Siddhartha repeated, murmuring the verse, Aum is the bow, the arrow is soul, the Brahman is the arrow's target, the one should incessantly hit. After the usual time of the exercise and meditation had passed, Govinda rose. The evening had come, it was time to perform the evening's ablution. He called Siddhartha's name. Siddhartha did not answer. Siddhartha sat there lost in thought, his eyes were rigidly focused towards a very distant target, the tip of his tongue was protruding a little between the teeth, he seemed not to breathe, thus sat he, wrapped up in contemplation, thinking on his soul sent after the Brahman as an arrow. Once Samanas had traveled through Siddhartha's town, ascetics on a pilgrimage, three skinny, withered men, neither old nor young, with dusty and bloody shoulders, almost naked, scorched by the sun, surrounded by loneliness, strangers and enemies to the world, strangers and lank jackals in the realm of humans. Behind them blew a hot scent of quiet passion, of destructive service, of merciless self-denial. In the evening, after the hour of contemplation, Siddhartha spoke to Govinda, early tomorrow morning, my friend, Siddhartha will go to the Samanas, he will become a Samana. Govinda turned pale when he heard these words and read the decision in the motionless face of his friend, unstoppable like the arrow shot from the bow. Soon in with the first glance, Govinda realized now it is beginning, now Siddhartha is taking his own way, now his fate is beginning to sprout and with his my own, and he turned pale like a dry banana skin. Oh Siddhartha, he exclaimed, will your father permit you to do that? Siddhartha looked over as if he was just waking up. Arrow fast, he read in Govinda's soul, read the fear, read the submission. O oh, Govinda, he spoke quietly, let's not waste words. Tomorrow at daybreak I will begin the life of the Samanas. Speak no more of it. Siddhartha entered the chamber, where his father was sitting on a mat of bast, and stepped behind his father and remained standing there until his father felt that someone was standing behind him. Quote the Brahmin, is that you, Siddhartha? Then say what you came to say. Quote Siddhartha, with your permission, my father. I came to tell you that it is my longing to leave your house tomorrow and go to the ascetics. My desire is to become a Samana. May my father not oppose this. The Brahmin fell silent and remained silent for so long that the stars in the small window wandered and changed their relative positions ere the silence was broken. Silent and motionless stood the son with his arms folded. Silent and motionless sat the father in the mat and the stars traced their paths in the sky. Then spoke the father, not proper it is for a Brahmin to speak harsh and angry words, but indignation is in my heart. I wish not to hear this request for a second time from your mouth. Slowly the Brahmin rose. Siddhartha stood silently, his arms folded. What are you waiting for? asked the father. Quo Siddhartha, you know what? Indignant, the father left the chamber. Indignant, he went to his bed and lay down. After an hour, since no sleep had come over his eyes, the Brahmin stood up, paced to and fro, and left the house. Through the small window of the chamber he looked back inside, and there he saw Siddhartha standing, his arms folded, not moving from his spot. Pale shimmered his bright robe. With anxiety in his heart, the father returned to his bed. After another hour, since no sleep had come over his eyes, the Brahmin stood up again, paced to and fro, walked out of the house and saw that the moon had risen. Through the window of the chamber he looked back inside. There stood Siddhartha, not moving from his spot, his arms folded, moonlight reflecting from his bare shins. With worry in his heart, the father went back to bed. 
and he came back after an hour, he came back after two hours, looked through the small window, saw Siddhartha standing in the moonlight by the light of the stars in the darkness, and he came back hour after hour, silently, he looked into the chamber, saw him standing in the same place, filled his heart with anger, filled his heart with unrest, filled his heart with anguish, filled it with sadness. And in the night's last hour before the day began, he returned, stepped into the room, saw the young man standing there, who seemed tall and like a stranger to him. Siddhartha, he spoke, what are you waiting for? You know what? Will you always stand the way and wait until it'll becomes morning, noon, and evening? I will stand and wait. You will become tired, Siddhartha. I will become tired. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I will not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I will die. And would you rather die than obey your father? Siddhartha has always obeyed his father. So will you abandon your plan? Siddhartha will do what his father will tell him to do. The first light of day shone into the room. The Brahmin saw that Siddhartha was trembling softly in his knees. In Siddhartha's face he saw no trembling, his eyes were fixed on a distant spot. Then his father realized that even now Siddhartha no longer dwelt with him in his home, that he had already left him. The father touched Siddhartha's shoulder. You will, he spoke, go into the forest and be a Samana. When you'll have found blissfulness in the forest, then come back and teach me to be blissful. If you'll find disappointment, then return, and let us once again make offerings to the gods together. Go now and kiss your mother, tell her where you are going to. But for me it is time to go to the river and to perform the first ablution. He took his hand from the shoulder of his son and went outside. Siddhartha wavered to the side as he tried to walk. He put his limbs back under control, bowed to his father, and went to his mother to do as his father had said. As he slowly left on stiff legs in the first light of day, the still quiet town, a shadow rose near the last hut who had crouched there and joined the pilgrim of Vinda. You have come, said Siddhartha, and smiled. I have come, said Govinda. Preview of next chapter with the Samanas in the evening of this day they caught up with the ascetics, the skinny Samanas, and offered them their companionship and obedience. Siddhartha gave his garments to a poor Brahmin in the street. He wore nothing more than the loincloth and the earth-colored, unsewn cloak. He ate only once. But wait, there's more. But first. Pause, close your eyes, and for the next five minutes don't do anything. Try to observe your thoughts, but don't wrestle with them too much. Just concentrate on your breath or the sound of the vibration. When you catch yourself in a thought, pat yourself on the back and gently guide your attention back to the sound. This practice of overcoming the compulsive obsession of always doing, hearing, seeing will serve you well in other parts of your personal and professional life. If you want to be the person who read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha or the person who meditates 20 minutes a day or the person who makes an impact on the world, you have to put in the time. My job is to make that as enjoyable as possible for you so you can have a positive impact on the world. Don't skip this. I promise you you'll thank me later as Will Smith said. The Marines have a saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die.
with the Semanas in the evening of this day they caught up with the ascetics, the skinny Semanas, and offered them their companionship and obedience. They were accepted. Siddhartha gave his garments to a poor Brahmin in the street. He wore nothing more than the loincloth and the earth-colored, unsewn cloak. He ate only once a day, and never something cooked. He fasted for fifteen days. He fasted for twenty-eight days. The flesh waned from his thighs and cheeks. Feverish dreams flickered from his enlarged eyes, long nails grew slowly on his parched fingers and a dry, shaggy beard grew on his chin. His glance turned to ice when he encountered women, his mouth twitched with contempt when he walked through a city of nicely dressed people. He saw merchants trading, princes hunting, mourners wailing for their dead, whores offering themselves, physicians trying to help the sick, priests determining the most suitable day for seeding, lovers loving, mothers nursing their children and all. But this was not worthy of one look from his eye, it all lied, it all stank, it all stank of lies, it all pretended to be meaningful and joyful and beautiful and it all was just concealed putrefaction. The world tasted bitter. Life was torture. A goal stood before Siddhartha, a single goal, to become empty, empty of thirst, empty of wishing, empty of dreams, empty of joy and sorrow. Dead to himself, not to be a self anymore, to find tranquility with an emptied heart, to be open to miracles and unselfish thoughts was his goal. Once all of myself was overcome and had died, once every desire and every urge was silent in the heart, then the ultimate part of me had to awake innermost of my being, which is no longer myself, the great secret. Silently, Siddhartha exposed himself to burning rays of the sun directly above, glowing with pain, glowing with thirst, and stood there until he neither felt any pain nor thirst anymore. Silently, he stood there in the rainy season, from his hair the water was dripping over freezing shoulders, over freezing hips and legs, and the pendant stood there until he could not feel the cold in his shoulders and legs anymore, until they were silent, until they were quiet. Silently, he cowered in the thorny bushes, blood dripped from the burning skin, from festering wounds dripped pus, and Siddhartha stayed rigidly, stayed motionless, until no blood flowed anymore, until nothing stung anymore, until nothing burned anymore. Siddhartha sat upright and learned to breathe sparingly, learned to get along with only few breaths, learned to stop breathing. He learned beginning with the breath, to calm the beat of his heart, learned to reduce the beats of his heart until they were only a few and almost none. Instructed by the oldest of the Samanas, Siddhartha practiced self-denial, practiced meditation, according to a new Samana rules. A heron flew over the bamboo forest, and Siddhartha accepted the heron into his soul, flew over forest and mountains, was a heron, ate fish, felt the pangs of a heron's hunger, spoke the heron's croak, died a heron's death. A dead jackal was lying on the sandy bank, and Siddhartha's soul slipped inside the body, was the dead jackal, lay in the banks, got bloated, stank, decayed, was dismembered by hyenas, was skinned by vultures, turned into a skeleton, turned to dust, was blown across the fields. And Siddhartha's soul returned, had died, had decayed, was scattered as dust, had tasted the gloomy intoxication of the cycle, awaited a new thirst like a hunter in the gap, where he could escape from the cycle, where the end of the causes, where, and, eternity without suffering began. He killed his senses, he killed his memory, he slipped out of his self into thousands of other forms, was an animal, was carrion, was stone, was wood, was water, and awoke every time to find his old self again, sunshine or moon, was his self again. Turned round in the cycle, felt thirst, overcame the thirst, felt new thirst. Siddhartha learned a lot when he was with the Samanas, many ways leading away from the self he learned to go. He went the way of self-denial by means of pain, through voluntarily suffering and overcoming pain, hunger, thirst, tiredness. He went the way of self-denial by means of meditation, through imagining the mind to be void of all conceptions. These and other ways he learned to go, a thousand times he left his self, for hours and days he remained in the non-self. But though the ways led away from the self, their end nevertheless always led back to the self. Though Siddhartha fled from the self a thousand times, stayed in nothingness, stayed in the animal, in the stone, the return was inevitable, inescapable was the hour when he found himself back in the sunshine, or in the moonlight, in the shade, or in the rain, and was once again his self and felt the agony of the cycle which had been forced upon him. By his side lived Govinda, his shadow, walked the same paths, undertook the same efforts. They rarely spoke to one another than the service and the exercises required. Occasionally the two of them went through the villages to beg for food for themselves and their teachers. How do you think, Govinda Siddhartha spoke one day while begging this way, how do you think did we progress? Did we reach any goals? Govinda answered, we have learnt, and we'll continue learning. You'll be a great Samana, Siddhartha. Quickly you've learned every exercise, often the old Samanas have admired you. One day you'll be a holy man, O Siddhartha. Quoth Siddhartha, I can't help but feel that it is not like this, my friend. What I've learned being among the Samanas up to this day, this, O Govinda, I could have learned more quickly and by simpler means. In every tavern of that part of the town where the whorehouses are, my friend, among carters and gamblers, I could have learned it. Quoth Govinda, Siddhartha is putting me up. How could you have learned meditation, holding your breath in sensitivity against hunger and pain there among these wretched people? And Siddhartha said quietly, as if he was talking to himself, What is meditation? What is leaving one's body? What is fasting? What is holding one's breath? It is fleeing from the self. It is a short escape of the agony of being a self. It is a short numbing of the senses against the pain and the pointlessness of life. The same escape, the same short numbing is what the driver of an ox cart finds in the inn, drinking a few bowls of rice, fine or fermented coconut milk. Then he won't feel his self any more, then he won't feel the pains of life any more, then he finds a short numbing of the senses. When he falls asleep over his bowl of rice wine, he'll find the same what Siddhartha and Govinda find when they escape their bodies through long exercises, staying in the non-self. This is how it is, O Govinda. 
Quoth Govinda, you say so, O friend, and yet you know that Siddhartha is no driver of an ox cart, and a Samana is no drunkard. It's true that a drinker numbs his senses, it's true that he briefly escapes and rests, but he'll return from the delusion, finds everything to be unchanged, has not become wiser, has gathered no enlightenment, has not risen several steps, and Siddhartha spoke with a smile, I do not know, I've never been a drunkard. But that I, Siddhartha, find only a short numbing of the senses in my exercises and meditations, and that I'm just as far removed from wisdom, from salvation, as a child in the mother's womb, this I know, O Govinda, this I know. And once again, another time, when Siddhartha left the forest together with Govinda to beg for some food in the village for their brothers and teachers, Siddhartha began to speak and said, What now, O Govinda, might we be on the right path? Might we get closer to enlightenment? Might we get closer to salvation? Or do we perhaps live in a circle we who have thought we were escaping the cycle? Quoth Govinda, we have learned a lot. Siddhartha, there is still much to learn. We are not going around in circles. We are moving up. The circle is a spiral. We have already ascended many a level. Siddhartha answered, How old would you think is our oldest Samana, our venerable teacher? Quoth Govinda, Our oldest one might be about sixty years of age. And Siddhartha, he has lived for sixty years and has not reached the Nirvana. He'll turn seventy and eighty, and you and me, we will grow just as old and we'll do our exercises and we'll fast and we'll meditate. But we will not reach the Nirvana, he won't and we won't. Oh Govinda, I believe out of all the Samanas out there, perhaps not a single one, not a single one, will reach the Nirvana. We find comfort, we find numbness, we learn feats to deceive others. But the most important thing, the path of paths, we will not find. If you only, spoke Govinda, wouldn't speak such terrible words, Siddhartha. How could it be that among so many learned men, among so many Brahmins, among so many austere and venerable Samanas, among so many who are searching, so many who are eagerly trying, so many holy men, no one will find the path of paths? But Siddhartha said in a voice which contained just as much sadness as mockery, with a quiet, a slightly sad, a slightly mocking voice soon, Govinda, your friend will leave the path of the Samanas, he has walked along your side for so long. I'm suffering of thirst, O Govinda, and on this long path of a Samana my thirst has remained as strong as ever. I always thirsted for knowledge. I have always been full of questions. I have asked the Brahmins year after year and I have asked the Holy Vedas year after year and I have asked the devote Samanas year after year. Perhaps, O Govinda, it had been just as well, had been just as smart and just as profitable if I had asked the hornbill bird or the chimpanzee. It took me a long time and I'm not finished learning this yet, O Govinda, that there is nothing to be learned. There is indeed no such thing, so I believe, as what we refer to as learning. There is, oh my friend, just one knowledge, this is everywhere, this is Atman, this is within me and within you and within every creature, and so I'm starting to believe that this knowledge has no worse or enemy than the desire to know it than learning. At this Govinda stopped on the path, rose his hands and spoke, if you, Siddhartha, only would not bother your friend with this kind of talk. Truly, you words stir up fear in my heart, and just consider, what would become of the sanctity of prayer, what of the venerability of the Brahmins caste, what of the holiness of the Samanas, if it was as you say, if there was no learning. What, O oh, Siddhartha, what would then become of all of this, what is holy, what is precious, what is venerable on earth? And Govinda mumbled a verse to himself, a verse from an Upanishad, he who ponderingly of a purified spirit loses himself in the meditation of Atman, unexpressible by words as his blissfulness of his heart. But Siddhartha remained silent. He thought about the words which Govinda had said to him and thought the words through to their end. Yes, he thought, standing there with his head low, what would remain of all that which seemed to us to be holy? What remains? What can stand the test? And he shook his head. At one time, when the two young men had lived among the Samanas for about three years and had shared their exercises, some news, a rumor, a myth reached them after we were told many times, a man had appeared, Gautama by name, the exalted one, the Buddha, he had overcome the suffering of the world in himself and had halted the cycle of rebirths. He was said to wander through the land, teaching, surrounded by disciples, without possession, without home, without a wife in the yellow cloak of an ascetic, but with a cheerful brow, a man of bliss and Brahmins and princes would bow down before him and would become his students. This myth, this rumor, this legend resounded, its fragrance rose up, here and there in the towns, the Brahmins spoke of it, and in the forest, the Samanas, again and again the name of Gautama, the Buddha reached the ears of the young men with good, and with bad talk, with praise, and with defamation. It was as if the plague had broken out in a country and news had been spreading around that in one or another place there was a man, a wise man, a knowledgeable one, whose word and breath was enough to heal everyone who had been infected with the pestilence, and as such news would go through the land and everyone would talk about it, many would believe, many would doubt, but many would get on their way as soon as possible to seek the wise man, the helper, just like this myth ran through the land, that fragrant myth of Gautama, the Buddha, the wise man of the family of Sakya. He possessed, so the believer said, the highest enlightenment, he remembered his previous lives, he had reached the nirvana and never returned into the cycle, was never again submerged in the murky river of physical forms, many wonderful and unbelievable things were reported of him, he had performed miracles, had overcome the devil, had spoken to the gods. But his enemies and disbelievers said this Gautama was a vain seducer who spent his days in luxury, scorned the offerings, was without learning, and knew neither exercises nor self-castigation. The myth of Buddha sounded sweet. The scent of magic flowed from these reports. After all, the world was sick, life was hard to bear, and behold, here a source seemed to spring forth, here a messenger seemed to call out, comforting, mild, full of noble promises. Everywhere where the rumor of Buddha was heard, everywhere in the lands of India, the young men listened up, felt a longing, felt hope, and among the Brahmin sons of the towns and villages, every pilgrim and stranger was welcome when he brought news of him, the exalted one, the Sakyamuni. The myth had also reached the Samanas in the forest, and also Siddhartha and also Govinda slowly, drop by drop, every drop laden with hope, every drop laden with doubt. They rarely talked about it because the oldest one of the Samanas did not like this myth. 
He had heard that this alleged Buddha used to be an ascetic before and had lived in the forest, but had then turned back to luxury and worldly pleasures and he had no high opinion of this Gautama. O Siddhartha Govinda spoke one day to his friend. Today I was in the village and a Brahmin invited me into his house and in his house there was the son of a Brahmin from Magadha who has seen the Buddha with his own eyes and has heard him teach verily. This made my chest ache when I breathed and thought to myself, if only I would too, if only we both would too, Siddhartha and me lie to see the hour when we will hear the teachings from the mouth of this perfected man. Speak, friend, wouldn't we want to go there too and listen to the teachings from the Buddha's mouth? Quoth Siddhartha, always, O Govinda, I had thought, Govinda would stay with the Samanas, always I believed his goal was to live to be sixty and seventy years of age and to keep on practicing those feats and exercises which are becoming a Samana. But behold, I had not known Govinda well enough, I knew little of his heart. So now you, my faithful friend, want to take a new path and go there, where the Buddha spreads his teachings. Quote Govinda, you're mocking me. Mock me if you like, Siddhartha, but have you not also developed a desire and eagerness to hear these teachings? And have you not at one time said to me you would not walk the path of the Samanas for much longer? At this Siddhartha laughed in his very own manner, in which his voice assumed a touch of sadness and a touch of mockery, and said, Well, Govinda, you've spoken well, you've remembered correctly. If you only remember the other thing as well you've heard from me, which is that I have grown distrustful and tired against teachings and learning, and that my faith in words which are brought to us by teachers is small. But let's do it, my dear, I'm willing to listen to these teachings, though in my heart I believe that we've already tasted the best fruit of these teachings. Quote Govinda, your willingness delights my heart. But tell me, how should this be possible? How should the Gautama's teachings, even before we have heard them, have already revealed their best fruit to us? Quoth Siddhartha, let us eat this fruit and wait for the rest, O Govinda. But this fruit, which we already now receive thanks to the Gautama, consisted in him calling us away from the Samanas. Whether he has also other and better things to give us, O friend, let us away with calm hearts. On this very same day, Siddhartha informed the oldest one of the Samanas of his decision that he wanted to leave him. He informed the oldest one with all the courtesy and modesty becoming to a younger one and a student. But the Samana became angry because the two young men wanted to leave him and talked loudly and used crude swear words. Govinda was startled and became embarrassed. But Siddhartha put his mouth close to Govinda's ear and whispered to him, Now I want to show the old man that I've learned something from him. Positioning himself closely in front of the Samana with a concentrated soul, he captured the old man's glance with his glances, deprived him of his power, made him mute, took away his free will, subdued him under his own will, commanded him to do silently whatever he demanded him to do. The old man became mute, his eyes became motionless, his will was paralyzed, his arms were hanging down without power, he had fallen victim to Siddhartha's spell. But Siddhartha's thoughts brought the Samana under their control, he had to carry out what they commanded. And thus the old man made several bows, performed gestures of blessing, spoke stammeringly a godly wish for a good journey. And the young men returned the bows with thanks, returned the wish, went on their way with salutations. And the way, Govinda said, O oh, Siddhartha, you have learned more from the Samanas than I knew. It is hard, it is very hard to cast a spell on an old Samana. Truly, if you had stayed there, you would soon have learned to walk on water. I do not seek to walk on water, said Siddhartha. Let old Samanas be content with such feats. Next chapter, Gautama and the town of Savathi, every child knew the name of the exalted Buddha and every house was prepared to fill the alms dish of Gautama's disciples, the silently begging ones. Near term, the town was Gautama's favorite place to stay, the grove of Jetavana. You're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are, not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. Left him, as a snake is left by its old skin, that one thing no longer existed in him which had accompanied him throughout his youth and used to be a part of him, the wish to have teachers and to listen to teachings. He had also left the last teacher who had appeared on his path, even him, the highest and wisest teacher, the most holy one, Buddha, he had left him, had to part with him, was not able to accept his teachings. Lower, he walked along in his thoughts and asked himself, But what is this, what you have sought to learn from teachings and from teachers, and what they, who have taught you much, were still unable to teach you? And he found, it was the self, the purpose and essence of which I sought to learn. It was the self, I wanted to free myself from, which I sought to overcome. But I was not able to overcome it, could only flee from it, only hide from it truly. No thing in this world has kept my thoughts thus busy, as this my very own self, this mystery of me being alive, of me being one and being separated and isolated from all others, of me being Siddhartha. And 
and there is no thing in this world I know less about than about me, about Siddhartha. Having been pondering while slowly walking along, he now stopped as these thoughts caught hold of him, and right away another thought sprang forth from these, a new thought, which was, that I know nothing about myself, that Siddhartha has remained thus alien and unknown to me, stems from one cause, a single cause, I was afraid of myself, I was fleeing from myself. I searched Atman, I searched Brahman, I was willing to dissect myself and peel off all of its layers, to find the core of all peels in its unknown interior, the Atman, life, the divine part, the ultimate part, but I have lost myself in the process. Siddhartha opened his eyes and looked around, a smile filled his face and a feeling of awakening from long dreams flowed through him from his head down to his toes, and it was not long before he walked again, walked quickly like a man who knows what he has got to do. Oh, he thought, taking a deep breath, now I would not let Siddhartha escape from me again. No longer, I want to begin my thoughts in my life with Atman and with the suffering of the world. I do not want to kill and dissect myself any longer, to find a secret behind the ruins. Neither Yogaveda shall teach me any more, nor Atharvaveda, nor the ascetics, nor any kind of teachings. I want to learn from myself, want to be my student, want to get to know myself, the secret of Siddhartha. He looked around as if he was seeing the world for the first time. Beautiful was the world, colorful was the world, strange and mysterious was the world. Here was blue, here was yellow, here was green, the sky and the river flowed, the forest and the mountains were rigid, all of it was beautiful, all of it was mysterious and magical, and in its midst was he, Siddhartha, the awakening one, on the path to himself. The easiest way to get into the meditative state is to begin by listening. If you simply close your eyes and allow yourself to hear all the sounds that are going on around you, just listen to the general hum and buzz of the world as if you were listening to music. Don't try to identify the sounds you're hearing. Don't put names on them. Simply allow them to play with your eardrums. And if you awaken from this illusion and you understand that black implies white, Self implies other. Life implies death, or shall I say, death implies life. You can feel yourself, not as a stranger in the world, not as something here on probation, not as something that has arrived here by fluke but you can begin to feel your own existence as absolutely fundamental. All this yellow and blue, river and forest, entered Siddhartha for the first time through the eyes, was no longer a spell of Mara, was no longer the veil of Maya, was no longer a pointless and coincidental diversity of mere appearances, despicable to the deeply thinking Brahman, who scorns diversity, who seeks unity. Blue was blue, river was river, and if also in the blue and the river, in Siddhartha, the singular and divine lived hidden, so it was still that very divinity's way and purpose, to be here yellow, here blue, their sky, their forest, and here Siddhartha. The purpose and the essential properties were not somewhere behind the things, they were in them, in everything. How deaf and stupid have I been, he thought, walking swiftly along. When someone reads a text, wants to discover its meaning, he will not scorn the symbols and letters and call them deceptions, coincidence, and worthless hull, but he will read them, he will study and love them, letter by letter. But I, who wanted to read the book of the world and the book of my own being, I have, for the sake of a meaning I had anticipated before I read, scorn the symbols and letters, I called the visible world a deception, called my eyes and my tongue coincidental and worthless forms without substance. No, this is over, I have awakened, I have indeed awakened and have not been born before this very day. In thinking these thoughts, Siddhartha stopped once again, suddenly, as if there was a snake lying in front of him on the path. Because suddenly, he had also become aware of this, he who was indeed like someone who had just woken up or like a newborn baby, he had to start his life anew and start again at the very beginning. When he had left in this very morning from the grove Jitavana, the grove of that exalted one, already awakening, already on the path towards himself, he had every intention, regarded as natural and took for granted, that he, after years as an ascetic, would return to his home and his father. 
But now, only in this moment, when he stopped as if a snake was lying on his path, he also awoke to this realization. But I am no longer the one I was, I am no ascetic anymore, I am not a priest anymore, I am no Brahmin anymore. Whatever should I do at home and at my father's place? Study, make offerings, practice meditation. But all this is over, all of this is no longer alongside my path. Motionless, Siddhartha remained standing there, and for the time of one moment in breath, his heart felt cold. He felt a cold in his chest, as a small animal, a bird or a rabbit, would when seeing how alone he was. For many years, he had been without home and had felt nothing. Now, he felt it. Still, even in the deepest meditation, he had been his father's son, had been a Brahmin, of a high caste, a cleric. Now, he was nothing but Siddhartha, the awoken one, nothing else was left. Deeply he inhaled, and for a moment, he felt cold and shivered. Nobody was thus alone as he was. There was no nobleman who did not belong to the noblemen, no worker that did not belong to the workers, and found refuge with them, shared their life, spoke their language. No Brahmin who would not be regarded as Brahmins and lived with them, no ascetic who would not find his refuge in the caste of the Samanas, and even the most forlorn hermit in the forest was not just one and alone, he was also surrounded by a place he belonged to, he also belonged to a caste in which he was at home. Govinda had become a monk, and a thousand monks were his brothers, wore the same robe as he, believed in his faith, spoke his language. But he, Siddhartha, where did he belong to? With whom would he share his life? Whose language would he speak? Out of this moment, when the world melted away all around him, when he stood alone like a star in the sky, out of this moment of a cold and despair, Siddhartha emerged, more a self than before, more firmly concentrated. He felt, this had been the last tremor of the awakening, the last struggle of this birth. And it was not long until he walked again in long strides, started to proceed swiftly and impatiently, heading no longer for home, no longer to his father, no longer back. And if by any chance, by any means, you find out that that is not so, you have an entirely new attitude to what human beings are doing, which may be very creative, but which also may be very dangerous. You see through the game. You are only just kidding that you're just poor little me. See, the function of a guru, that is to say a spiritual teacher in India, is to look, give you a funny look in the eye because you come to him and say, Mr. Guru, I have problems. I, I, I suffer and uh, it's a mess and I can't control my mind and I'm miserable and depressed and so on. And he gives you a funny look. And you feel a bit nervous about the way he looks at you because he thinks, you know, he's reading your thoughts. And this man is a great magician. He can read everything that's in you. He knows right down into your unconscious and you know all the dreadful things you've thought and all the awful desires you have and you are rather embarrassed that this man looks right through you and sees them all. But that's not what he's looking at. He's giving you a funny look for quite another reason altogether. Because he sees in you the Brahma, the Godhead, just claiming it's poor little me. That's why he gives you a funny look. 